Madam Weinberg, Alice Pratt Brown Director here at the Whitney Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 15th Walter Annenberg Annual Lecture. The Annenberg Lecture features a distinguished artist who has made a significant contribution to American art and culture. Previous speakers in the series have included Klaus Oldenburg, Hiroshi Sugimoto, Sarah Z, Lorna Simpson, Catherine Opie, and last year's speaker, Kara Walker. The lecture series was created in 2003 in honor of Ambassador uh, Walter H. Annenberg with the late Steve Ames, who was a much beloved trustee and dear friend of mine here at the Whitney Museum. I would like to acknowledge this evening the Annenberg family, including Stephen's wife, Anne, who is sitting right here, and Regina Annenberg Weingarten, as well as Liz Kabler, who are all here to join us this evening. Um, thank you for your tremendous support of the museum. Um, tonight's program has been actually made possible by the support of Grow at Annenberg, a philanthropic initiative led by Gregory Annenberg Weingarten, who is the vice president and director of the Annenberg Foundation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jason Moran for the 2019 Annenberg program, an artist whose work is truly interdisciplinary. Jason Moran's achievements defy categorization and move between and among genres and disciplines. One of Jason's greatest strengths is his skill as an improv impro improviser. And so our conversation tonight will be its own kind of improvisation, especially as he just got off a plane from Japan. <laughs> um, it might be slightly choreographed or two, but I will follow his lead. Since his arrival in New York City in the 1990s, Moran has distinguished himself as a leading voice in the contemporary jazz world. Through his dynamic improvisation, composition, and performance, he has infused jazz with elements of hip hop, funk, Afro beats. And one of his most celebrated musical projects is The Bandwagon, the trio Moran formed with bassist Taris Mateen and drummer Nasheed Waits 20 years ago. Boy, how time goes. The trio constantly seeks out the boundaries of jazz in order to break down the decades old limits and achieve a contemporary sound that responds to and collaborates with modern culture. The bandwagon will be forming in this very room on this very stage in the coming days. There are a handful of tickets left if you want them, but go quickly. Um, and they will be looking back at their 20 years together. Um, uh, and this is, a, I think, a key part, a centerpiece of the exhibition of Jason Moran's work, which is on view on the eighth floor, which I hope you have all seen. If not, I hope you will see it because it is time is short. And it was curated by the brilliant Whitney curator who originally did it for the Walker Art Center, Adrian Edwards. Where are you, Adrian? Here. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Moran's deep understanding of jazz seemed to extend into an innate ability to blend language, sound, and visual media, which we'll hear about tonight, into works of art that blur the boundaries between sculpture, performance, and conceptual art. His collaboration with visual artists, including Carrie Mae Weems, Adrian Piper, Joan Jonas, Adam Pendleton, among many others, have become fully or fully immersive experiences. In whatever form or genre his work takes, Moran's projects are always deeply historical and his references range across black musical forms. As Adrian wrote in the catalog for the show, drawing parallels between alienated labor of black Americans in both sites of entertainment and economic production. The current exhibition is Moran's most recent engagement with the Whitney. His history at the Whitney goes back to 2011 with his collaboration with Glenn Ligon, The Death of Tom, which was included in Ligon's mid-career mid survey, which is the first thing you hear when you go up on the eighth floor, and it's the first thing I hear every morning as I walk into my office. It's a lovely way to begin each morning. Um, the piece is a reimagining of the final scene in Edwin S. Porter's silent film, Uncle Tom's Cabin, for which Jason composed the score. Um, the, and the scene is a non-scene, which is kind of an amazing thing in and of itself. In 2012, Jason and his wife and frequent artistic partner, Alicia Hall Moran, here, who is here herself tonight, who is an extraordinary artist and performer in her own uh, right, wor who works between the genres of opera, art, theater, and jazz, were included in the 2012 Whitney Biennial. They presented Lead, which was a five-day performance gathering with more than 90 performers 
um, it was really wild, and, and, and it was um, an incredible range of, of concerts, talks, collaborations featuring Joan Jonas, Esperanza Spaulding, Adam Pendleton, Lorraine O'Grady, Bill Frisell, Rashida Bumbry, and Kara Walker, among others. Moran has exhibited and performed internationally, including at the 2015 Venice Biennale, curated by the late, great Oquian Weezer, who we miss dearly. Jason has released 15 albums on both Blue Note Records and Yes Records, um, and as a visual artist, he is represented by Loring Augustine. Among numerous, numerous awards, he was named a 2010 MacArthur Fellow, and, MacArthur, and Jason currently serves as the Kennedy Center Artistic Director for Jazz and teaches at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. And to end, and I guess to begin, I want to end and begin with two quotes. The first is, jazz is not sitting out there on an island by itself. The music is affected, and jazz is one of those forms or music that maps America's progress. And I say, progress. Jason said that. And sound comes at you in waves. What you hear is for you. Your hearing will never be duplicated again. Remember that tonight. Did you know that? That's how it is. Listen. Alicia Hall Moran. I'd like to welcome Jason to the stage, um, and thank you for being here. It's um, a great, great pleasure and honor to have you. Thank you all for being here. I think we're all sounded up and ready to go. <laughs> So, um, you know, being that it's that Christmas spirit, let's go to the first picture. I like it. Jason really, you know, th this is a man who has practiced at being on stage. We ask him for some pictures of when he's a kid, and he, the first one has the Christmas tree in it. So, um, <laughs> so Jason, you, you were um, um, born and raised in Houston, and, um, uh, you know, it's a, a city that's known for its music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what was the kind of music that um, influenced you when you were growing up? Let's see, I grew up in Houston in the 80s. Now there's two musics that I think are penetrating my household. Um, my older brother, who's three years older, he's listening to everything coming from New York that's hip hop, right? So everything that he's listening to, I'm trying to figure out. Then there's like a, my parents listening to two things in the car. <coughs> My mother had a tape of Glenn Gould's Goldberg Variations, which was every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, and you know what? Um, it was its own performance because she drove with hot tea <laughs> in one hand, and then you know these, you know these these Bach pieces that, that, are, that progress and some are ripping fast and some are so slow and delicate. Mm -hmm. And she's driving and she's kind of spilling a little bit <laughs> through Houston, right? And, but then she would always make a point to say, you hear how he's breathing, you know? Mm -hmm. Because you would always audibly hear him right. go through a passage or a phrase. And it was like her acknowledging like, oh no, his body is present in the yeah. work, right? It's not like devoid of the person. I always thought that was helpful to hear every morning, right? Mm -hmm. To go through, to go to school and have that now. Um, and I might say the other thing that I was hearing was mm -hmm. you, you heard a lot of country music and then, but I heard it through like my grandparents and like the soulful versions of country mm -hmm. music. And it was the music I kind of still aspire to. I haven't quite gotten to mm -hmm. find the project that I, to really deal with what country music means, especially mm -hmm. to Texas. Um, but it's, that's the stuff that I'm hearing in the house. So you, mm -hmm. it kind of goes across a lot of regions. And um, it made, um, and I never thought about my music making like I'm trying to do in this picture. As part of that, I really thought of it as its own thing, not that I was a musician, because at that age, I hated the piano so much. I detested that 
very position. <laughs> you know, well, that's um, why I can see your mom's really watching you to make sure you don't move. <laughs> and and my, my mother, you know, she is the one, um, she's the one who's at lessons. She's the one who took notes. Um, I have all the books of the notes she took. And she also ends up learning how to play piano by watching my mm -hmm. lessons too. So it's really that position, us two together, the two mm -hmm. Aquarians in the family together, we found something in music. And we used to, was it classical piano that you were? Yeah, but it, you know, it's, it's classical, but it's like Suzuki classical. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, uh, a little, Know it well. A little, a little, a little light, but, um, <laughs> but really good, you mm -hmm. know, and really hard to play well. And I think probably, you know, that's, I know that was an aspect that um, my teacher from that time period is a woman named Yelena Kuranets, and she was first generation Russian immigrant in Texas teaching piano. And um, I always tell this story, but I tell it here for the record, because the way she would teach piano and the way your hand position should be at the piano is curved hands. And if I ever dragged my wrist low, then she'd say, Jason, there are spikes sticking up <laughs> from the piano and you are slicing your wrist, and blood is all over the keys. <laughs> so that's how you started making artwork on the keys. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of intensity, you know, where she told me where you touch the piano, you know, where the tip of the pad of the finger. Like, it was very tactile. Um, mm -hmm. And it and it changes your relationship to an instrument when somebody really is pounding those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You're learning about the body and the car, you're learning about it in the lesson. And then when you arrive to the instrument, you think the touch mm -hmm. is the most magnificent part about playing piano. It's not, it's, for the pianist, it's, the sound is only part of it. It's really finding the touch at the instrument. You know? That's really interesting because you're so attuned. I mean, I, <clears throat> I love that you think of, that you were thinking about Glenn Gould breathing and the sense of the body. So. Well, it made it also fun to listen to, mm -hmm. right? So you could not only listen to Okay, the, those are yeah. some of the greatest pieces of music, great. Mm -hmm. But you could listen to the, the odd part in the song, mm -hmm. right? Like the glitch, yeah. you know? And um, as a young listener, we're not really, you know, trained to listen like that, but she mm -hmm. wanted us to find something fun in it. And, and, it, and it really left an indelible mark. Thanks. So, um, I was curious because you're, this is a painting that you grew up with in your house, is that right? Yes, <clears throat> this is John Bigger's Shotguns. Um, my parents uh, were friends of John Bigger's. Yeah, he taught in Houston. He taught at Texas Southern University, mm -hmm. very important art school was led by him. And my uncle, who's really the artist in our family named Joseph Moran, mm. he was a student of Bigger's and my father, who could be an artist, but really just decided to do some other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. My uncle told my father, you should buy this. <laughs> and so we had this painting in our house. Um, and and so, I, so a lot of the time spent practicing was around works from people in the community, mm -hmm. whether they were ceramic works by Carol Sims underneath mm -hmm. the piano, uh, prints by Biggers here, the painting in the main living room. And the painting was often out on loan, too. So it would, this crate would come, and it would pack it up, and it would leave the house for a year and a half. Then it would come back, and we'd put it back on the wall. And, uh, and the shotgun houses are part of a fixture in Third Ward, Houston, mm -hmm. which is where I'm from, mm -hmm. the neighborhood. And, you know, I don't know. That, Biggers also meant a lot with what layering should become for a musician. You know, so it's, there's this top layer. Mm -hmm. But then there's all the layers of meaning underneath mm -hmm. it. Um, and my father and mother spent a lot of time talking to my brothers and I about these paintings and what they meant to our family. Um, but then also I recognized that everybody in my family, so all my aunts and uncles on both sides, they all also had this work. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't seemed... Uh, Unusual. Yeah. yeah, it seemed That's like it was, should be a thing you live with. You should right. live with people who understand layers and know how to make them visible. And it was, uh, I mean, that painting is a uh, masterwork. Well, it's a wonderful environment to grow up in where art is part of who you are and what you do and not something that's 
out there. I mean, and it sounds like you were very much surrounded by it, both in terms of your parents' sensibilities, the music, the art. Yeah, I, you know, it's strange. Um, I mean, maybe it's not strange. I'm, my wife and I are parents now, so we watch our kids interact with names, sounds, people, stages, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And a parent doesn't know what they're creating, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. And that's scary, you know. Like, if I sit at the piano, I kind of know when I'm going to stop. <laughs> right. But a child is like, mm, I have more for you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you more about that as we go along. That's, you know, and, and you know, yeah. like that's it. So, you know, my parents also, but, right. you, but we, we, we could tell what they cared about because they kept right. drilling it home for mm -hmm. us, too. And, and Biggers just became like, like one of the most important symbols in our house was his work. Because it mm -hmm. was, there were many. And this many is one of his of really great masterpieces, yes. too. Yeah. I mean, to have a painting of that level, it's yeah. incredible. So um, you went then. You went to um, uh, the school of um, what was it? School of Performing Arts in Performing Houston. Visual Arts, right, right. <laughs> and I had followed. I made him, him dig out yeah. all these early pictures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah but th this is. Was this when you were in high school? This is high school, mm -hmm. and I had fallen in love with Thelonious Monk. Um, I mean, that's like. There's no better fan than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was a searching the wall. There's like nothing else on the wall. But John Coltrane how, just got in the frame. But right? how, did, how, did, how did you get introduced to Thelonious Monk and how did you get introduced to jazz? Because you're mostly doing right. your Suzuki and obviously you're listening to things. Were your right. parents big jazz fans? Or? They were. They were. They that was the other thing also that was in the car. They listened to the KTSU, the Texas Southern mm -hmm. University had an amazing radio station. I mean, unbelievable mm -hmm. college radio station. You hear every style of music, every style of black music, mm -hmm. every day of the week. Uh, and it was predominantly jazz. And, but one day, I walked into my parents' room. They were watching television. Of a, and there was a, a, a plane crash that had some US delegates on it. And one mm -hmm. of them was from Houston, a politician named Mickey Leland, mm -hmm. who was a friend of theirs. And so he died in this crash. And they were watching the wreckage on television. And, but there was no sound coming from the television. Mm -hmm. But they were listening to Thelonious Monk mm -hmm. playing his most famous composition, Around Midnight. And, mm. and I walked in. And, you know, there's a, every room has a tone, right? A sonic tone, but also a feeling tone, too. And that room, when I walked into their bedroom, mm. was, was, was dense with a kind of weight. But the only thing kind of piercing it was Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. And um, Glenn Gould was never serving that function, right? <laughs> like they wanted something else for mm -hmm. this moment. Right. And Thelonious Monk uh, ended up being it. And I'll play the beginning of it because it's right. one of the most striking um, introductions to a piece of music. Uh, he starts like this. my favorite piece of music. Um, he just goes on to tell this story. Mm -hmm. Sounds very different from all of his other recordings of that song. It's its masterwork, right? Like it's mm -hmm. the same as the John Biggers to me. It's like precise and perfect. But somehow when I kind of got it way into Thelonious Monk and when I would mm -hmm. share with other people, older 
people who would ask, oh, so you like jazz? Oh, so who do you, who do you listen to? And I'd say Thelonious Monk. And then they'd often say he didn't have technique, right? So <laughs> wait a minute, huh? Right? Like, wait, this is the best musician I've ever heard in my life. And now you're, you're saying he has no technique, right? And then I would lear later learn that there were all these kind of criticisms of hmm. his style, uh, the way he comped. You know, mm -hmm. Miles Davis famously tells him during a recording session, don't play while I'm playing, right? Like, <laughs> like there, there's tons of stories like that. Huh. But meanwhile, I think this is the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. And it then shifted everything, which meant I put him at the top and everybody had to measure to him. And mostly people came up short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it felt good to reorganize for myself what the criteria was for being a great musician, because it's very different than Glenn Gould. So here's, he's finding his own touch. Mm -hmm. He's finding his own sonic language. Mm -hmm. um, and then I become this big fan. And at the same time, I'm in high school. I'm trying to gather up the skills. And I have lots of friends who are helping me along the way. And uh, Are there people who are playing jazz at that time? Are you playing? A lot of people. You, there are. A lot of musicians, <clears throat> a lot of older musicians who are saying, oh, you're interested? Oh, well. I actually have this gig at this club, and let's play. Mm. And so I started playing with a lot of the older musicians when I was in high school. And in the school, with my school group, we would go out and play all over the city. Mm -hmm. And in my senior year, we went to play at the Cancun Jazz Festival. Mm. So I got a passport, right? <laughs> and then there we were, really was not a great chaperone. Uh, it sounds Cancun. like a really good chaperone. <laughs> I'm glad we made it back home. That's all I could say. <laughs> but, it, um, but then you start to see the function of the music, which up until that point, I only knew it. music was really to practice. Mm -hmm. The performance part of family came over, Jason, play something, right? Then, OK. But now I was kind of seeing the function. And, and that started to help. Because maybe the function when I was in high school was like, oh, you can make some bread. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have some, you're, you didn't have to ask. But for at that money. point, were you thinking that you were going to be a musician at that point? Or at what point did it kind of connect that this was not just something you were doing on the side, but this was going to be a way of life or could be? I mean, this is strange to say, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel that way until I made my second record for Blue Note Records mm -hmm. <laughs> that I actually thought, oh, Maybe this I'm a musician now. I had gone through Manhattan School of Music. Mm -hmm. I had signed with possibly the best jazz record label of all time, mm -hmm. Blue Note Records. Mm -hmm. And I was on my second record mm -hmm. that I felt like maybe, right, that's my first one. <laughs> well, I have the same haircut. This is like, <laughs> and you look pretty much the same. Steve, you? The and so how did you end up at Manhattan School? And, um, and, and you studied with um, uh, Jakey Baird Jackie there? Jackie Baird. Mm. Well, you, so I think every student should find, well, for me, it was important to find a master, mm -hmm. just simple. And uh, I mean, yeah. a master teacher and a master But did player. you know that Jackie was there and I that's did. why you went there? I begged my parents to let me go to Manhattan School of Music mm -hmm. because he was teaching there. And Jackie Bayard was prominently known for being in Charles Mingus's group the great group with Eric Dolphy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that group, they were political. Yeah. They covered the basis of technique and the history of jazz. You know, mm -hmm. uh, They were brave. Um, they were often misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like that's the right teacher <laughs> to have. And, and was he a great Monk fan? He's huge, and even the, there was a moment during the, near the end of Monk's life where sometimes the promoter wasn't sure whether or not he would play a concert or mm -hmm. not, how he'd feel that night. So Jackie Byard would be on the tour also, just in case. And he tells this story, because he tells this story about Thelonious Monk that this promoter was really kind of trying to bait Monk to say something, you know. Mm -hmm all night long, all night long, asking him to say, and Monk is in his famous silent mode. Mm -hmm. And then after about two hours, he just says, something. <laughs> and that, so my teacher, Jackie Byers, so he was with everybody. Mm -hmm. 
And, and did he introduce you to people no, or no? No, he introduced me to He just did you to the music, to the piano. He introduced me to that. How so? What did he do? But what his, so the hands are, the hands, they come with weight. Mm -hmm. And you have to find how and where you want to place your weight. It's like a boxer, mm -hmm. like you have to shift it every once in a while. Mm -hmm. You have to know when you want to lay something heavy mm -hmm. down, when it needs to go light. Mm -hmm. And Jackie's way of doing that was to show me like a, a plethora of music across the decades. So something from the 1920s, something from the 1950s. Here's music from the 1990s. Now let's go back to the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to 1960s. Mm -hmm. Now let's pause. I want to tell you about what it was like to be in World War II. Mm -hmm. Then he unfolds all that, right? And then we close it back up. Now let's look at big band music, right? So it was, it was a ritual. So where did you start to feel your weight falling? Where did you start to feel <laughs> at that point? By, hmm. I think people were determining my weight for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I knew. You were too young to I kind was of too young to know, but unformed. people were complaining about me, and that's what I thought. Oh, okay, maybe that's what I am. Meaning the pianist that kind of gets on people's nerves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work. Um, in the in Manhattan School of Music, they had three big bands, and mm -hmm. I was famously for one semester in the third big band, the bottom big band. And I was the alternate pianist. <laughs> so I was like, I got something for all the alternates out there. I'm gonna, so Me too. Here's this big band. So, they, so big band songs, they have this way of setting up a break. It just builds up. Piano break. So I had played stuff in rehearsal. That's what I'm going to do, mm -hmm. right? director was like, cool. I get on stage in front of the audience. And when that break came, I stood up and I just started picking every random note from the inside on the strings. Just bing, 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 bing. And I just saw the director go on. <laughs> so you were an iconoclast right from the beginning. Well, then that was the end of that career. No, I wasn't a, I wasn't a big band pianist. And I think I, you know, I, want, I liked the experience because I love big band music. Mm -hmm. But when I think about pianists who do that well, Earl Hines and Duke Ellington, Mary Lou Williams, you know, when they do it well, Count Basie. You, Was it too many rules for you? Well, that's the thing. See, Thelonious Monk talks about big band idea. And in a very private conversation, he says he likes it, but the big band idea is too stiff. Mm -hmm. And he's also wrestling with it, too, because this con conversation mm -hmm. that I'm talking about is mm -hmm. a concert where he prepares for his return to New York at Town Hall, and he's expanding his music to 10 musicians, mm -hmm. when traditionally he had done it for four to six oh, musicians. Yeah. So he's like, so it's a, it's, it's a, it is, it's stiff. It doesn't have to feel stiff. I mean, And you so, were clearly feeling that way. I mean, even your connection to him years before in Houston, when you were listening to it, that... You're already gravitating to something so. much more open-ended and more experimental. I, but I always thought that the experimental part, which I think sometimes gets laid on to musicians, is actually the standard. There's nothing really great or experimental about being experimental in music. It's actually where you're supposed to start from. I mean, that's what I always thought. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and when I hear Thelonious Monk, it just is, it starts there mm -hmm. at every turn He's considering where to twist it and also where to put his slang, mm -hmm. you know. And if there's something that I was probably trying to figure out with where my weight was, mm -hmm. it was around repertoire. Mm -hmm. That the, the weight would be in how you select songs for an audience mm -hmm. to hear next to each other that probably would never touch each other in history. Mm -hmm. A DJ might not ever do it, but in a concert, you could actually pull together relationships that you probably never See, thought it's a, You talk the way curators talk about when they put pictures together, too. It's, um, it's, it's the relationship. Kind of, it's, it's, it it's makes the it. juxtapositions as much as it is what the individual elements are. Yes, yes. And how they make meaning and shift the way. Well, you talk about at one point, I, I, something I read about how Thelonious Monk's notion of space mm. 
Mm. What, what did you mean by that? I mean, is, is that a kind of sense of oral space or visual space for you? I mean, you know the phrase "mind the gap." Mm -hmm. It's like that. <laughs> I mean, like he's he considers it at every step. Like, mm -hmm. hmm. you know, I mean, and that takes guts. In when he's in the crew with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, who are playing a lot of notes, right? He's like not really. He's Open finding more of the space between in between and them, and hmm. and he's a dancer also. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps him because he really he's still coming from mm -hmm. that the body moves mm -hmm. with this music. Mm -hmm. And there are these famous, you know, these, I think they recently put Straight No Chaser, the documentary about him, on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, it's worth just watching the footage um, because it's, he's great to watch, too. Mm -hmm. But he does these spins, you know, and he does these gestures that are as much about his sound at the piano as they are, like, this is a, mm -hmm. this is a position, a body position. Mm -hmm. and, and you hear, when you watch him dance, you hear how he sounds, you right. know? Uh, and that, that, that means a lot. Well, this, I mean, and actually, I mean, we'll move up to the next, where are we up? We have bandwagon, because it's interesting, because we will get to that point where we talk about your collaborations, because it's interesting, because as you talk about things, you, you're not even, in some ways, not even talking about music, you're just talking about Choreography, visual, all of it, and um, and and it's a, a sort of common language of different languages in a way. Right, and and at Manhattan School of Music, there was it took some time to find the relationship. So fortunately, being in New York City, I would, couldn't wait to get out of class to get into the city, and walk the streets because I didn't trust the subway. So I used to walk every weekend from uptown down to the end and walk it back up mm -hmm. and that somehow helped gauge where I was in the city. You know, like Teju Call's book about walking. Yeah. yeah, it so that part started to help uh, mm -hmm. so then you say okay where am I going to stop and the Village Voice was a great map mm -hmm. to say oh well go see this show you know and so I would go see I remember very vividly going to see Bruce Nauman's retrospective mm -hmm. at MoMA or very vividly going to see the migration series by Jacob Lawrence at MoMA. Like, very vividly going to see Thelma Golden's Black Male Show at mm -hmm. the Whitney. Vividly. Mm -hmm. These were parts of the walks that I would take when I got out of class. And of course, walking to see a bunch of music too, and spending every dollar kind of going to experience something. Because I, coming from Houston to New York is a very tricky transition. It's just tricky. <laughs> yeah. And Houston's not a place where people walk all that much. I mean, whereas in New York, it's a walking city. Houston's a car city. It is a car city. Yeah, so it's really different. And so... It's a horse city, too. <laughs> <laughs> so bandwagon, that began when? Yeah, this is 98, 99. Yeah, 99. Mm -hmm. By this point, we're cool, so... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but when we started, we were... Three, you know, three musicians who were all, all I think, I mean, Taras and Nashi could tell you uh, later this week, they'll tell their stories. But <laughs> I think we were all three, you know, musicians who were a little bit outside. Mm -hmm. and, and when we were all together playing for another band, it was, it caused a bit of a situation in the bands. It, the chemistry, was between you all, yeah, and, it, and not sometimes the others. It, it was a struggle, mm -hmm. I think, for some people, because also we were three people who felt a little bit like, oh no, this can go anyway, and some band leaders don't really want that; they want their way, mm -hmm. and so. But we're backing you up, so <laughs> you kind of have to do what we, right. what we, what we say. Right. We lead, you follow, <laughs> and it, and it, you know, and so it started to ruffle which I thought we thought was great and 
And so we became a band. And you met them after Manhattan? I met Nasheed Waits, the drummer, while I was still in school at Manhattan School of Music, mm -hmm. playing with a singer, Cla mm -hmm. Clarissa Sincino. Mm -hmm. And Taurus, I met after I got out of school with Stefan Harris, vibraphonist Stefan Harris. And, uh, and we famously were the rhythm section for, when I signed with Blue Note Records, we were the rhythm section for a group called New Directions. Mm -hmm. And we went on a 20 city tour uh, sponsored by Camel Cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening anymore. <laughs> So, but, mm -hmm. but they sent us on a U.S. tour of 20 cities. Now, you have no idea how rare that is for a jazz group. Mm -hmm. I mean, Herbie Hancock doesn't do a 20, okay, I shouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. he, he, Maybe he, he did at one point, <laughs> right. But I'm talking in the 90s and two, like it's very, America has done something with the music that has pushed it to other shores. Mm -hmm. And so we tour other shores frequently, a 20 city tour. But a 20 city American tour is just still very rare. It's like a fossil. And at the beginning, were you, was it just sort of a pickup group and then you became something? Or at what point did you know that this was like a commitment? We got to, a, we got to Atlanta and mm -hmm. two things happened. It just, we were, we were free. Mm -hmm. And the other band was like, I don't know what they're doing back there. But right. This is, and, but Nasheed Taras and I knew, we were like, this is it. And somebody came you backstage and talked to me about negative space. And I was like, mm -hmm. tell me more, right? Mm -hmm. like, and it, like, so there, there was just enough that once we finished the tour, then we just stayed together. And by the time we get to this record, which is recorded at the Village Vanguard, we had found the, 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 the right mix of music mm -hmm. and the right attitude. And also we were finding our audience at the same time too, mm -hmm. which is a very key component mm -hmm. in trying to develop something because you have to play music for people. Right. And they have to feel it and experience it and return it to right. you. Yeah. Why don't we go on to the net? Because actually um, we're getting right into the, where are the visuals. I mean, you went and you did a, a residency at Walker Art Center in um, Minneapolis. and. Was that the first time you'd done something in a museum setting or working in that context? That was, yeah, the Walker Art Center was commissioning new work for their new theater they were right. making. And so they asked if I would consider the, the permanent collection at the Walker. And through that, it was, it was things were kind of at a breaking point. Um, I say breaking point because after touring kind of in the jazz world, then mm -hmm. you see a pattern emerge. And the ideas around those patterns are tricky. And I didn't want to get stuck in any of those patterns. And I was trying to break the pattern every time I did a record. I was trying to move myself. And did the visual arts serve as a kind of vehicle to help you break that in this case? Well, it felt like coming home. You know, it mm -hmm. felt like I could acknowledge the thing that I grew up with. Um, mm -hmm. And the Walker Art Center had works by Adrian Piper. Mm -hmm. And yes, and Adrian, <laughs> Adrian, she made things real again. I think mm -hmm. I had forgotten that. And mm -hmm. they don't teach you that. In and when you say school. real again, what do you mean by well, that? In music school, they, the, I had great teachers, but I mm -hmm. often was not considering it as part of anything that was real. Mm -hmm. I don't, and what I mean by real yeah, is do you mean the real I mean, about world? anything, you, mean? Mm -hmm. you know, for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you pinpointing any emotion, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was making music, mm -hmm. making records. Mm -hmm. And I probably, I don't know if I was consciously doing it. And I think I'd seen an exhibition of Adrian's in Barcelona. And I never felt so interrogated as a viewer in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like she just was like, oh, right, right at you me. know, like mm -hmm. every every time I get to a new work, it was just coming, mm -hmm. drilling me. But she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't. Did, I mean, she's there, you right. know. But, but did you feel before that that your work was just becoming either too abstract and too detached from the world? What when you say that it was getting real? Something really shifted there for you. What was that? Is that if I, if I had built a, uh, if I was building a language around improvisation that would move into the abstract, 
and no one ever really talked to me about what abstraction was in jazz, damn. And here I was making these records. And, <sighs> and, I, and I thought, oh, I have to, I have to reckon with this. Mm -hmm. uh, Cecil Taylor has a lot of language around his work in his own language too. Right. Right. <laughs> and Adrian was like probing that for me. And when we met, yeah. Um, how did you meet? I mean, how did it come about? A few phone calls, and then she said, or through a messenger, mm -hmm. <laughs> they said, show up to Cape Cod to her house at 1 o'clock p.m. on this day. Do not bring anything to write with or <laughs> anything to record with. <laughs> so boom, 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 not 1 o'clock, just making sure I'm on time. And then we had a seven, six-hour conversation in her, in her house. And it, and I, it was, it's like also in that moment when you're not allowed to bring anything to document, then you turn your ear on in a very different way. Mm -hmm. You wanted to hold on to everything and remember everything. And it was a remarkable pressure that she put on me. And we talked about everything. Did she ask a lot about your work and your music? Well, she, and of course, she, she has done all of her research before I arrived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's not going to let anybody just enter her house and not know what I do. Mm -hmm. She knew all of it mm -hmm. and, and asked me some heavy questions that mm -hmm. I don't share um, mm -hmm. about, about what I was doing, about mm -hmm. what I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe, you know, yeah. uh, maybe I'll play this piece. Yeah. There's a piece called Artists Ought to Be Writing. Mm -hmm. Great and piece. it was written for the Walker Art Center. So the work just, it, she says it all. So this became a thesis, basically. In making the work are and related things. If artists' intentions and ideas were more accessible to the general public, I think it might break down some of the barriers of misunderstanding between the art world and artists and the general public. I think it would become clear the extent to which artists are just as much a product of their society as anyone else with any other kinds of vocation. Artists ought to be writing about what they do and what kinds of procedures they go through to realize the work, what their presuppositions in making the work are, and related things. If artists' intentions and ideas were more accessible to the general public, I think it might break down some of the barriers of misunderstanding between the art world and artists and the general public. I think it would become clear the extent to which artists are just as much a product of their society as anyone else with any other kinds of vocation. Pianists ought to be playing. <laughs> yeah. That was wonderful. And pianists have to know language. And, and maybe that was also what was starting to turn. Was this became a part of a series of works that were mm -hmm. 
dealing with language and you know you have a feeling about what someone's saying if there's a great guitar solo that Jimi Hendrix plays or you have a, a, a feeling uh, about how Leontine Price sings a phrase right and you have the lyric but you have a feeling of all that so at the piano then what do you what do you want to say mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong knows what he wants to say and that's very difficult because it doesn't, the phrase right. in jazz is, you know, tell your story. Mm -hmm. They say that. Older mm -hmm. musicians say, tell your mm -hmm. story. They say, oh no, to tell, tell your story. Or they say, take your time. Like, take your time telling mm -hmm. your story. Or they say, shut up. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop telling your story. <laughs> uh, that also happens. <laughs> I don't want to make it totally romantic. But, that, but, but Adrian now helps to, and these other works help to layer the language in the hand, which, you know, is very necessary. The other big component in this piece, Milestone, which was kind of a look into the li uh, my life with my wife, Alicia. And we put that on a stage for an audience. So there was a band on stage, and then there was a backstage. And then the third component was Alicia was in another city, and she would call in. But she was on the stage too. So she written mm. four pieces that were about this distance mm -hmm. between her and the band. Minding the gap. Minding it, yeah. And so, so there, there were just these layers. And mm -hmm. as a performance, it was, you know, it was our first mm -hmm. real moment of trying to put something on the stage that felt extremely personal. Mm -hmm. And it felt good. Mm -hmm. And it felt necessary for that point. Um, so the Walker Art Center really kind of helped kick off, you know, an idea about where the two can meet, and um, and also to give us space to to make it too, which was remarkable. Well, I like you say they say the things that you are looking for are looking, looking for, for you. you. Yeah. So let's go on. We have speaking of people who are looking for you. Um, Joan Jonas, who just came back from performing, she just got the Kyoto Prize, and literally just got back from performing mm -hmm. in Japan um, last night. Maybe go to the next image. <laughs> just say a little bit, maybe a few words about Joan and what she was looking for, what you were looking for, and how you found each other. At this same, there's a, a thing happening. This is also about this time. Let's see if I can make it through this. <laughs> Joan and Adrian Piper arrive in my life when my mother dies. Mm -hmm. She dies. I literally am answering an email about meeting Adrian Piper when my mother is dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the hospital and I tell my mom, I'm going to meet this lady, Adrian Piper. I'm very excited. She was gone like a week later. So these two women mm -hmm. with all these ideas um, and help mm -hmm. uh, show up. So Joan comes to see a performance at the Jazz, Jazz at Lincoln Center when they were opening their new building at 59th mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. And Adam Pendleton had sent her. Uh, and she was looking for a composer. And after the performance, she just calls me on the phone two days later. Mm -hmm. And Joan has uh, a very distinct voice. And she just says, I got your phone number out of the phone book. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, I'm doing this performance at Dia Beacon, which is called The Shape, The Scent, The Feel of Things. And we worked on it all summer. And I'd never worked that hard on a single thing, like meaning work at the piano. So I spent seven hours. And at how, the did you, how did you work together? I mean, Joan. Seven hours at the piano, Monday through Friday, while Joan. And did she? Do pieces, you would respond to it. Was it an improvisation between the two of we you? We were just you... looking for stuff. Mm -hmm. She had lots of videos that she was trying to figure out where, how, when can something move. She has a text that she's mm -hmm. editing. Mm -hmm. How, when shall it be distributed to the actors, you know, who are all Did you feel artists. comfortable? I mean, here all of a sudden. Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Mega. Mega. But at this a certain is... point, things started. Click or what? I mean, 
I don't know. I mean, I saw I mean, it, and I thought it clicked, in, but I didn't see the process. But, I'm just, it but was at what deep. point did, I mean, obviously, she was doing her thing, you were doing yours. And at some point, you sort of found each other in your, in, in your languages. I think what Joan has worked so hard at developing the language that I think a lot of people now use. Mm -hmm. She really was just was making the work decade yeah. after decade after decade. And, mm -hmm. and here I am also just like tr trying to hold on because she's telling me what she likes, what she doesn't like, mm -hmm. move on to another mm -hmm. idea. But I have like eight more hours to go that day. You know, mm -hmm. like, and I, the first week I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. I, was home to like laid you feel out like you because I trying to keep no musician up with her too. no musician worked me that hard right. ever and also I'm playing in basically a garage you know in the bottom of right. Dia That's you cool. know like so the piano sound it's not a concert hall it yeah. sounds crazy yeah. but over you spend three months in that that space then all of a sudden things start to emerge songs start to emerge you know ideas themes started to emerge. And she was like, yes. And I remember really clearly one day when she, she, said, she has a phrase which, I'm going to step in. Mm -hmm. I Meaning she's going to step into the scene now. Mm -hmm. And she stepped in. Mm -hmm. And she picked up this maybe 11 foot stick with a parachute attached to the end of it. And she started wielding this thing. Now, Joan is probably about five foot four. Yeah. Wielding this. And, and I started playing. I was like, oh, this is like, oh, this is real. <laughs> like this feels real. This is this is necessary. Yeah. Oh, this is vibrant. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is challenging. Oh, mm -hmm. this feels right. And and also uncertain about what any of it means too. Mm -hmm. And I felt that was helpful too, for me at that moment. So it was a little bit like Monk in a way too, where you weren't sure where it was the open endedness that really appealed to you, and yes. the fact that you didn't fully know where it was going. Right. And then and she would she'd want like sounds that were harsh mm -hmm. and then she'd want sounds that soothed, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it just pushed me to make pieces that I would never just come up, come up with if I was writing for the jazz group, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or I just wouldn't. And it was like, it changed the way the band sounded too because I brought these songs back to the band and they were like, oh, these are great. <laughs> And so it had, it had it had value in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And then it was, I think it was Adam, I think, who introduced you to Joan, is that right? And I mean, and you, I mean, we have lots of great images here of, uh, of collaborations with various people, and we can't go into them in, in great depth, necessarily. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, here, for example, um, there's Kara. Um, but, I mean, why don't we st talk a little bit, I mean, this is when you kind of enter Whitney life, I mean, mm. when you did Bleed and, mm. and Alish put it together. Um, what was the idea of it? You were invited to be in the biennial and, and how did it all come about? Why did you call it Bleed? What was, what were you doing with it? What did you think you were doing with it? Um, okay, so I, I brought a little treat for you. This vintage 2012 <laughs> Bleed programs. I brought some to give away because we have like 600 of them at home. <laughs> so I said, let me give some of these away. And inside Bleed, you know, I'm going to leave one here. Um, let see, do we have an artist statement, Alicia? Well, so Bleed is where things meet. And it's Alicia and I having five days on the top floor of the Whitney. Actually, was it the top floor? Fourth floor? Fourth Eighth floor. floor. Fourth floor. Yeah. Second to top. Second to top. <laughs> and, and we invited a lot of people to come into the room with us and to make things that had not seen the public before. Uh, Carol Walker here performing with the bandwagon. Um, Joan Jonas performed with the bandwagon. Alicia Hall Moran doing the Motown project. Uh, Alicia Hall Moran doing who runs the world girls uh, with Tycho <laughs> drumming group. Um, we have Charles Blow reading from his book. Right. We have uh, Akiba Solomon reading about gender matters. Uh, we have 
art songs, Alicia and I wrote songs for Joan Jonas, Glenn Ligon, Whitfield Lavelle, and Fred Wilson, Wangeshi Mutu, Lorna Simpson, Pat Steer, Carol Walker, Carrie Mae Wings, and then I wrote a song for Alicia. Um, we have Jocelyn Luckett giving uh, a sermon. Um, we have Adam Pendleton with Lorraine O'Grady with a string quartet. Um, you, you, it went on and on. Bill Frizzell with us doing a piece about the G's Ben quilt. Did you, did you, what kind of frame did you give them to work in? I mean, did you direct it? Did you just give them a time It's very directed. <laughs> it is very directed. It's very directed. In, the, in here is, we have this space, this time to make something uh, and each person can consider what they'd like to do. Greg mm -hmm. Tate did a piece about the TRC versus the AACM, that revolutionary chicken versus the Association for Advancement of Creative Musicians. It's a, it's a, everybody, we looked for the strong parts of everyone and then asked them to, to make something that represented well, that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the point is he can't answer it by himself because he doesn't know by himself. <laughs> He's half of that. So and what was the what was the everybody will bleed, it's name bleed, you'll remember, because it it's gonna hurt. It's gonna be terrible to make this. I'm living in Boston and you're becoming famous and it's gonna be painful and we can't say no. So there's going to be blood everywhere, <laughs> like, but like birthing a baby. Yeah. So we can only invite people we would ostensibly make a baby with. Yeah. <laughs> and I was on Broadway at the time understudying in Porgy and Bess for like an icon. So I wasn't going to miss my chance to see them do what they do every time. I, we did this, and I wasn't going to not be on Broadway. So on the times when I had matinees, we put in the people where I could be dead, and we, this would blow up. Mm -hmm. Kara Walker was put during our Thursday night show. I knew I couldn't be there. That has to be Kara. That has to be Esperanza, who could be a wife in jazz to Jason should I die. That is the point. <laughs> Greg Tate. I guess this was really directed, for sure. <laughs> Every single person has a different marriage our lives, mm -hmm. either to us as an individual, yeah. should the other perish in the art form, mm -hmm. not proximity to. Mm -hmm. Rashida Bumbray, I saw her, that's a piece she already had made, and I saw it uptown with five, six people. Mm -hmm. But when we got the invitation for Bleed, we're like, we, I won't be there on Sunday morning. I have a matinee. I'm not missing it. We need church. So she came and did the church. And that badass woman brought 25, 26 people. So everybody, Kara was asked to do something like a lecture that would perform with her and she could use the band if she wants. But who she is, she brought a tour de force that people will never forget and bared her shoulders and wore leather and brought whatever she, you would have to interview her to know what she brought. But I know what I asked her to do, and that wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> That's her. Well, it's a good thing these people are your family. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, but they wouldn't do it if when we asked, they couldn't tell individually. You would have to ask them why they each said yes. Very different people. Yeah. Bill, why? But I knew we were asking with the depth of, and I've never said this out loud, and I told Jason, never tell these people this, they don't deserve it to know. But you, you've earned it tonight with this beautiful program. And I will tell you, the secret is, should we perish and not freaking make it to the day, these people will be down for us, and they will carry it through with Jason, I'm not there. They will be there for me if he won't be there. And they will let our kids run around. So there's a choreographer who makes work with her kids. And she brought her kids, real life children, and our real life children, to make all the music you would hear and all the dancing you would see. And we didn't tell anybody what the schedule was. They were really wanted to know because we didn't want people to come and just watch the famous person. Because that's not who me and Jason are. 
So you're going to get who you going to get when you can be there. And that made every audience member a detachment of our family because it was God sent who they saw. And I think, and you know, also... You know, it's funny. I mean, because it did have an urgency to the whole thing, and you felt. And I, I, I was supposed to be working at the time, and I found that I was in the galleries all the time because I didn't want to miss anything. That sense that something was happening. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know half the performers, but I didn't want to miss any of it. And I think people felt that. And I think. Mm -hmm. To me, that's also a sign of really great art. When art has that urgency, that you feel like it's when you were saying what you know, making it real. Mm. That's what I think of is that sense of urgency that you're expressing. So, so I'll leave these here, so I don't want to take those home. Absolutely. <laughs> Curious ones to know about bleed. There it is. <laughs> so you've worked with Kara a number of times in lots of different ways. I mean, right? Here, yeah. That's this amazing. was most recently. McGuan. I guess since this is the signal we're running out of time because they're flying through the slides, but yeah, well, I mean, I, I, should, yeah. I mean, I have to say though, each mm -hmm. of these people who are, whose images have just popped up, <laughs> I've seen their work around the world. So it's really important to see people's work not in the home country. Really important. Why so? Because it just, you help know who you are because you're far away from where you're from. And you help the, they help you see the place you've left and that they have left, that the work has left. Mm -hmm. And I've seen their work all around the world. Mm -hmm. And you see it with fresh eyes in a way that you wouldn't see it. It's like shift, all, pulling it out of its context. Well, you know, the, the, just the language alone, just walking mm -hmm. through and getting your ticket in Spanish or in Portuguese and then walking mm -hmm. into a space, mm -hmm. it, you, everything is different. The, 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 the food is different, everything. So when I, when they they walk in and mm -hmm. say, well, let's try to make something together, carry it with these videos about mm -hmm. things that happen in, in, you know, in history. I wanted to go up into our show because when you're talking All about right. this, when you're talking about spaces and contexts, mm. in a way, maybe this is a good way to come. Yeah, up. yeah. I mean, I think that she's asking for something that's real. There's a there's a child getting raped by a gang. Nobody's asking me in music school to score that. And you have to, to find something in music that has never been asked of a composer. To, to situate something so violent mm -hmm. that you could never imagine, to situate sound with it mm -hmm. specifically is one of the more terrifying parts about making music. So like the Thelonious Monk in the car and the plane crash. It's, yeah, and it's... It, it, these, they, those artists work hard, and they mm -hmm. asked me to do very difficult things. Glenn Ligon asking to deal with this, this song by you know, Burt Williams, you know, singing in blackface, black man singing in blackface, writing a song called Nobody. Right? So, all right, go dig on that. You know? And uh, you know, each one of them. And I appreciate it, much like Joan, much like Adrian, that they okay, you can make all that over there, but what I need from you right now, and it's very, it's demanding, because it's, it's the kind of fire, the kind of hurt, mm -hmm. the kind of blood that I think is necessary to continue to try to help sound manifest. Uh, and so these spaces, like this is the club or version of Slug Saloon, which was a club where Jack, Jackie McLean, a saxophonist, used to say that the bar, the, 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 the the door man at the door, if he didn't like you, then he'd pull out his chain and beat you with it. So he hit Jackie McLean in the mouth with a chain. He's a saxophonist, mm. right? Like this is a club that you go play music in, you know, on the Lower East Side in the 70s, you know? So, so and it's also where a trumpeter, Lee Morgan was murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, so there's something about what happened to music in New York in the 70s that slug starts to pull up but i think these you know these that music situates itself in a in places that are very can 
can cause love and can cause fights. Um, the Village Vanguard. I've, and what's the responsibility you know. of the musician in all of this? Or is there? I, I was playing with Paul Motion at the Village Vanguard, and people like to fight to his music. A lot of fights happen in the Village Vanguard mm -hmm. with Paul Motion <laughs> playing drums. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Actually, I do know why. <laughs> I'm just not going to say it. Um, <laughs> I think for, for an audience, I know in, in our annual visit to the Village Vanguard in November, our role is, is to reset the country. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's from our perspective, mm -hmm. but we're, we're in a mode of reset. And we use it as a new year, like let's start now. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the way New York feels in November too. Like it's mm -hmm. like just starting to get cold. Mm -hmm. People are just starting to appreciate warmth indoors, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and when they descend into the basement of the Village Vanguard, they they know that now you're in a space where this has happened for decades, 80 mm -hmm. years, almost 85 years. So you know that November's mean something uh, in the city. And in those times, that's when those songs sometimes find the audience, because we don't use set lists ever as a band. In 20 years, we don't write a set list out before. And so when we walk onto the, to the stage, then it's really finding what we think the audience needs to hear. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've been up there when Michael Brown's verdict was announced. You know, like, like you, the country also tells you mm -hmm. what you're supposed to play. And, and I don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. and, and I let that seep all up onto the stage, lather the songs in it, let it drip mm -hmm. onto the floor, wipe my face with it, you know, throw the towel away, you know, throw water on the audience, have the audience throw water back, you know? Like we send out the music like that and it, it sometimes finds the right, the right temperature. Well, I will end there, but I will ask you to play one more thing. Maybe because I, I wasn't going to ask you to do it. Put, put his artwork up in the back on the screen. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm. Would you mind playing us one more thing to go out on? Sure. That would be great. Sure. I wasn't going to ask, but I couldn't help myself. Well, this is my, you know.
What a gift. Happy holidays. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, what a gift. Bravo. Bravo.